Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. In this legal cast, we have Dina Young and Adam Gomez joining us to explore the aftermath of the East Palestine train derailment and the ensuing legal implications. Join us as we investigate the environmental and health hazards faced by the community, the regulatory and oversight lapses, and the ongoing quest for justice on the behalf of the affected individuals. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark York at Legal Cast and Mass Tort News. I am joined today by Dina Young from Berger Monte and Adam Gomez from Grant Eisenhofer. Dina is uh, with us from Philadelphia and Adam is from the wonderful litigation capital of Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us. Today we're going to be discussing the uh, East Palestine, Ohio train derailment and the aftermath of uh, the mishmash of litigation. Now it appears to be governmental interaction from various agencies who had no concern before. That's my personal view. But it seems like they were not overactively active in uh, monitoring trains and chemicals, et cetera, and now they are. And with that, I'd like to you know, hand this over to you, uh, Dina and Adam, for introductions, and then your point of view, if you want to just offer about what's going on and and how we got to this intersection of uh, the problems in East Palestine. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Dina Young. Um, we're happy to be here and appreciate Mark inviting us both uh, to speak. And um, so this is a really sad story. Um, the people of East Palestine are suffering and um, are scared and worried and concerned about their health risks. Um, associated with the toxins that were released from this crash, um, the Norfolk Southern uh, train derailment. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we're trying, we're doing everything we can to help those people and to try and um, figure out, you know, just how far this class goes, you know, how many miles outside of the, um, outside of the, the, what's the word, Adam? The crash site. Yeah, the um, Right. Yep. Right. Um, does is does the effects are the effects felt? Um, so you know we're looking into that and we're trying to you know make these these uh, residents of East Palestine feel comfortable in their representation and and trying to help them as best as we can. Yeah. So hi everybody. My name is Adam Gomez. Um, I'm at Grant Eisenhofer. We're one of the four um, interim class and lead counsel for now the consolidated litigation uh, in the Northern District of Ohio for the derailment. Um, you know, Mark, uh, you kind of mentioned from your point of view that now agencies and the government are starting to care about trains and derailments and toxic releases. And you know, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I think this case is just the natural consequence of really decades of deregulation of the railroads. Um, they have had unfettered uh, ability to put profits over safety. Um, they've developed an entire um, approach or strategy to railroading called precision scheduled railroading that is designed to cut all safety measures away um, from their operations in favor of speed and moving, you know, one rail car from point A to point B as fast as possible. Um, and this is what you get. And it really shouldn't surprise anybody because here we have an explosion and we have a significant release over, like Dina said, a very potentially widespread area of these hazardous materials, but derailments happen literally every day. And all of those trains, um, there's a high likelihood they're carrying hazardous materials as well, even if they don't leak or they don't explode. So that's the real takeaway, I think, and reason why we are where we are is you've got an industry that cares about nothing except 
its profits and how fast it can move things from A to B. And a government that by and large, until maybe the last 90 days, hasn't really cared too much about reining that industry in. Uh, so uh, the chemical cocktail, that's what we'll call it, <laughs> that was uh, dispersed after the crash and it burned. So it was airborne as well as, you know, water, you know, into the ground, the seepage, et cetera. And then if I'm not mistaken, it hit quite a few uh, creeks and rivers. And so it, that means that, that there was a pretty rampant spread. Uh, are, are there, there was a different group, but there was more than one specific chemical that was kind of, uh, you know, I guess, uh, released during the crash. What were some of the chemicals there and some of the risks? Yeah, so um, there were uh, at least 12 different chemicals um, that were in the rail cars that actually derailed. There were more hazardous materials on the train, but those were not part of what we call the pileup. Um, one of the issues right off the bat was there was a lack of communication about what exactly was in the derailed rail cars, right? Because knowing what's in there and in what quantities dictates the response, dictates evacuations, monitoring for health effects, et cetera. And that took a long time to get to come out. But what we know, at least as of today, was um, the primary chemical was vinyl chloride that everyone's been talking about. Um, vinyl, cl vinyl chloride's a carcinogen been well established that exposure over or significant exposure to vinyl chloride can cause different types of cancers. Um, but then there was other chemicals like benzene, butyl acrylate. Um, uh, yeah, the, and those are all carcinogens also. So, yeah. you know, when you <laughs> add them together, it creates this toxic combustionable soup that has rained down and poured and, you know, got all over these people's homes and they're, their ground, their property, the air. And a lot of these folks in East Palestine also use well water. So, you know, that's very concerning to them that the water that they use day to day is, could be contaminated by these, these, um, these chemicals, these carcinogens. Uh, if just, I mean, from growing up there and I did not like the well water whenever I grew up there, I can say that right now. And I don't like it whenever I go back there, but uh, once that water's contaminated, the migration, you know, the, the plume, whatever they want to call it, that really doesn't have, that's hard to mitigate. There's nothing you can really do about it. Once it's in the, in the groundwater contamination, there's, it's, this is like a decades long thing for what they would say for it to naturally disperse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned it before, Mark, that there's a lot of tributaries for surface waters that are in the area. Um, I mean, there, there's a, a there's a, a run called Sulphur Run that quite literally is just a few feet off of the track where this happened. Um, and that's where this pileup happened. That's where the leak happened. That's where the explosion happened. That runs into a creek, which then makes its way to another creek and eventually to the Ohio River. Um, so you have direct contamination in that water. You have contamination into the soil. And then add to that an explosion that sends all of these particulates potentially over a 30 mile area. You've got three different methods of contamination, all of which to one degree or another end up making their way into the soil, right? And if once you've got this stuff in the soil, it takes time, but it eventually gets to the groundwater. Um, and that's, I think, one of the major environmental concerns, putting aside the health effects is being able to monitor for what are these chemicals doing in the soil over time? And is there a kind of an existential threat five, 10, 15 years down the road when this stuff really reaches the aquifer? That's, I think, one of the biggest concerns people have. Okay, so it seems that, you know, whenever you mentioned that uh, they didn't know, they had an idea of what was on some of the rail cars, but they didn't know how much the size of the, you know, I guess you call it by gallons or, or liters or whatever it is. But isn't that a clear lack of, of governance, or, you know, of oversight where they're sending this stuff down the rails at 30 miles an hour at times 
and they are not really monitoring what's going on there. Isn't that in and of itself like a pretty catastrophic failure on their part? Or is it just don't There's have, so, many, don't so many failures along, <laughs> along the trail here. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's 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 two discrete failings, right? The first is that you would think there should be regulation about notifying states or local governments as to what's coming through or passing through on the rail with every train, right? There's not, at least in any meaningful sense. There are regulations that dictate what kind of information should be on the train about a hazardous material load and how rail cars that contain hazardous material should be labeled. Um, so that if there is a derailment, the minimum is first responders can tell what, what are they dealing with, right? Um, that wasn't met here either. So there's a failing of regulation. And then there's a failing on the part of Norfolk Southern to live up to even the minimal <laughs> level of information sharing and transparency that's required under our current kind of system for hazardous materials. You would think, wouldn't it? I mean, whenever they're tracking a rail car, I know that they all have a number and an identification code on it. Some have the little placard that says hazardous materials or not. But you would think that they don't ever lose track of the rail car as it's going from New York to San Diego or whatever it is. You'd think that they would be able to hit a little button as part of the something to say there's a hazardous material in this car so they can have an automatic tracking or something. If there's a fail safe that would that would be available or would this just be a once again don't ask don't tell if we're not forced to do it we're not going to do it i think this is another example of you know putting profits over safety is you know if we if we don't have to do something and we don't have to regulate a specific issue let's just not and um, see what happens which is what happened here well, i recall not too long well 10 or 15 years ago, I don't know, you guys aren't quite as old as me, and but growing up in Ohio, there's trains everywhere. There used to be the caboose, which they don't even have anymore, but there used to be a guy, the, the reverse, I forget what they called the guy in the caboose. And he was the guy that always communicated about everything. And they got, first they got rid of the caboose. And then there used to be like a mandatory three people, I think, somehow, on a train and now i think a lot of instances it's down to one person on a two mile long train is that kind of a standard now yeah that's that's all part of this precision scheduled railroading that i mentioned at the very beginning it's the idea that you run a skeleton crew essentially um if you only need one person to operate the locomotive that's all you get right and uh, typically it's a two-person crew but like you said, across a two mile train, carrying all this hazmat, running 30, 40, 50 miles an hour down the track, um, that's not a lot of resources. And you add to that something that happened in this particular case, you get readings that indicate that there's a problem with one of the rail cars. Well, with only two guys on the train, it's going to take you a long time to stop that train get back to the rail car, identify if there's actually a problem, separate it out, re, re kind of construct the train and then move along with that particular rail car off to the side. That incentivizes people to not stop, right? It incentivizes um, employees who are judged by whether they get to the next stop on time uh, to not stop. And that's probably, uh, I think it's going to be borne out. That's what we see here one of the things that happened what well, real real crashes are common occurrences all the time I've, i mean i see 500 you know five thousand gallons of fuel leaked or oil or this or that but um is this did this grab the headlines because this was in ohio which is a fairly you know center state you know and it's uh it's kind of like right in the middle of america's heartland that this got a little bit more attention than something that happened out in the middle of nowhere is built to put it more bluntly is it something along those lines because i've seen like i i mentioned to you the national institute of health is hosting a town hall meeting tonight well i think happen normally you know even norfolk southern had has had derailments since this 
since the East Palestine derailment. So you're right, they are common occurrence, but this one was pretty disastrous um, in terms of the size and the breadth of um, damage uh, potentially that it has caused. And so, and, and then the toxic chemicals that it's released into the environment and uh, soil, water. So I think that is why there's so much um, talk and litigation about this this specific derailment. Um, also, the, the derailment, you know, the crash and the uh, explosion or the controlled release, as they called it, took place in a neighborhood, in a community, like right smack in the middle of a town where people live. Um, so oftentimes that's not the case and there will be uh, a derailment in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it, that's not what happened here. Are they going to be able to throw up the uh, federal, you know, there's federal FILA, whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the the railroad acts and all those things. Are they going to try to throw that up, do you think, and say, hey, look, we, could, we were in compliance with what the federal, you know, what's required, the minimal, no matter how bare bones it is, we were not at fault in what we were doing. We, we met the requirements. Yeah, I, I think you see that in every railroad case, right? There's going to be some um, argument that the claims are preempted because of the regulations under the Federal Railroad Safety Act. Um, but in this case, you know, there's definitely things that went wrong that are governed by those regulations. Um, Norfolk Southern just didn't live up to those minimum expectations, but there's a lot that went wrong here that the government doesn't touch on at all. So it's kind of completely outside of those defenses or those preemption arguments. Perfect example of that is, you know, there's been focus on the hot box detectors, which for those that don't know, are sensors that are uh, installed at regular intervals along the track. And they're very precisely calibrated to measure the temperature of the wheels as they go by on the rail car. Um, the use of those detectors, the, um, uh, the, the interval that they're placed, how often they need to be inspected and calibrated, all of those things, they're not, they're not governed by federal regulations whatsoever. So what the company does is subject to kind of standard negligence principles when it comes, when it comes to, to those things. More importantly, and Dina alluded to it just now, you know, this case has an actual explosion that happens in a residential community that straddles the line, the state line between Ohio and Pennsylvania, that's not governed by any federal regulation. That kind of hazardous material response, um, that's completely outside of the playbook. In fact, that's only ever happened one other time, and it was in the 1980s in Louisiana. So Norfolk Southern's decision to do that is wholly outside of anything that the federal government has to say or any defense that the federal government gives railroads under something like the federal railroad safety act if uh you know if i'm mixing trichlor tce and benzene and a couple of other cocktails on a train all linked up in 10 cars is it is that going to be would that be considered a heightened risk where someone don't have to be a chemist to know that if you mix those together and there's a risk of a derailment, putting those together is going to catastrophically expand the dangers. Is that going to be like a, a, an aggravating factor that you're going to be able to say, look, you put all that stuff right there together, knowing that there's a, you know, whether it's a 5% or a 2% or whatever chance, percentage chance of a crash, that put those together, they're going to be more volatile mixing together versus just a, you know, something else. Yeah, I think it, it highlights and takes it to another level in the sense that everything that Norfolk Southern failed to do is is not just normal negligence, right? It's recklessness at this point. You, you know, you're doing that with coal or corn or plastic pellets, something that's not going to cause huge environmental or health effects. If it derails, that's one thing. But this main line of Norfolk Southern's corridor is the pipeline 
for hazardous materials. This train is actually called the bomb train, colloquially. That's what the people that have worked for the company in the area know. This train is the bomb train because it contains all of these chemicals that can explode and cause these problems. So when you take that into account, the failure in all of these different respects is definitely heightened. Yeah, and we're we're looking forward to getting the discovery on this case to see exactly what Norfolk Southern knew, which we presume is everything, you know, that, that Adam just talked about, that they were carrying <clears throat> these toxic chemicals that were combustible, that, um, you know, they were <clears throat> not following lots of the protocols that they are required to, and then many just standard negligence, um, you know, the standard duty of care that they should have adhered to as well. So it's just, uh, it's a really sad story for these um, East Palestine residents. So what is, is this like a guy, I'm just using Philadelphia as, a, as an example of a starting point where they just couple whatever comes in there together, just they got to get 400 cars from Philadelphia to uh, let's say Seattle and they just put them all on the train and say, there you go, hook them together and off they go. Seems like it. I, I don't really know how they make those decisions, but I, I'm sure we'll find out. Yeah, it, it, it raises the question of, again, this PSR, Precision Scheduled Railroading. The, the idea there, as I understand it, and it's certainly nuanced and varies from railroad to railroad to railroad, is effectively you take whatever you've got in the yard that needs to go in the general direction that that train is heading. You couple as much of it as you can together while it's all there and just keep them moving. You sort it out as it gets closer to the destination. Um, there's less planning for where do train or where do rail cars fit into the, the line, what's called the consist relative to one another to make sure you have weight and balance and all that kind of stuff then you'd think instead it's, Hey, we got 400 cars that are heading East from this point. We got a train that can take 400 cars, hook them up and get them out of here. Here's a question. Who insures the railroads? Are they self-insured or are they, they have catastrophic reinsurance and, and other things that's, you know, do you have any ideas yet of where, I mean, that seems like that would be a big risk that they're carrying. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I expect that there's some combination there, and we'll we'll find out here in, in pretty short order. But, um, you know, having been on the other side of this and done a fair number of uh, – and didn't, done a fair amount of insurance work, uh, I would imagine that a lot of this risk is borne directly by the company. It's just too much, I think, to, to really place a market for. Because if you have an event like this that's catastrophic, um, that itself could, could be – you know, to be devastating to the insurance industry, add two or three of those together year after year, and you've got a real problem. Yeah, we'll be getting their initial disclosures soon. So we'll have more information on that. Ed. Uh, do you do you think there's a disparity between the rail lines? Are, are some a little bit better operators than others? Or is it just generally across the board? And I'm not trying to throw you know, Burlington Northern or anybody else under the bus. But just generally speaking, are there known differences that you're aware of in, in what in some rail practices in their shipping? I don't you know, know the answer to that. Yeah, okay. I, I, I wouldn't. I'd say this. There's there's not, I think, a reputational difference, right, between all of the different class one railroads. And that's in part because they kind of operate as regional monopolies. Um, you know, Norfolk Southern is the player out here. CSX may be a player in a different region. Um, and when they're all subject to the same set of rules, they've all figured out how to get around those rules in pretty much the same way in order to stay competitive with one another. So they're by and large, I think, operating very similarly. So all of these companies have derailments and... I think it's, it just shows that there's a problem, you know, in this country with regulation and, um, and that, what did you call it? The precision schedule railroading, Adam? Like, 
there's got to be changes there. It, you know, these companies can't just think of profits. They got they have to think of the safety of the people and neighborhoods that these um, trains are going through. Okay, one thing I get around Washington D.C. quite a bit, and normally I would have thought that there would have been a few uh, more politicians demanding or having hearings. I mean, you know, really jumping on the bandwagon about getting, uh, you know, some changes instituted and reworking what the laws and regulatory compliance is here. You know, are you seeing that or do you just think it's just not evolved yet? I haven't really seen that as a, a talking point lately, uh, but it should be. I think that's a good opportunity for politicians to talk about and make this an important issue because I think if you were to ask most Americans, you know, it, does it matter to you if the tracks are safe and the trains going through your towns are safe? They'd say absolutely, and they'd vote accordingly. You know, I, I there was a big push in the immediate aftermath at the federal level for there to be more comprehensive safety regulations. It's been crickets on that in the last... 30 to 60 days. And while there's more of an appetite and maybe even an ability to regulate on a state by state basis, that's not permissible, right? It's all, it's all subject to federal regulation. The federal, federal regulations are supreme. So I think you have this tension between the actual communities and states where all these trains go through. They want to do something about it. And maybe even federal legislators, senators, et cetera, from those areas want to do something about it. But nationally, it's very easy for once this falls out of the limelight to kind of go back to business as usual. Um, if I've ever you know, recognized a perfect opportunity for the lobbyists to get involved and, smack and just suppress something, this would probably be it. Because I know the railroads have a pretty significant uh, reach into DC because it's just it's transportation, logistics, and, and everything else that goes with it. It's especially with the it, it impacts the trucking because trucking a lot of it goes on the rails, so they have a they have a pretty significant effort. So maybe we'll talk off record about that and how they get some things going there. So now going to the most critical part of this, your clients. What do you see as you know if by happenstance, some of your clients get to see this or you share this with them to get them, keep them updated. What, what's going to keep them kind of, uh, give them a sense of well being of that something's going to come of this. I mean, I, you've got the, some of the best, uh, class action firms in the country, uh, on their side. And we're all, you know, putting our resources together to, to go to fight, Norfolk Southern on their behalf and and we won't stop until they're compensated appropriately. Um, but you, you're right. They are scared. They're worried. They're, you know, they have their, some people are raising livestock and worried about that and worried about, you know, their gardens and growing their own food and their water supply and the air they breathe. Um, so it is, it's, and we can't assure them that it's safe because we don't believe it is safe. So, um, you know, what we tell our clients is that, you know, we're doing everything we can as quickly as we can. And we're going, you know, we're, we, we, um, put forth our, you know, discovery schedule, which was more aggressive than, than the defendants, um, to try to get this case, you know, going on a fast track. Uh, no pun intended, or, or pun intended, but we're doing everything we can, and, and, and we want the clients to know that we are doing that and that we're here for them. Um, yeah. So this is not being flippant, but did the governor ever drink the water? Because I remember he was saying, the, I'll drink the water. So do you know if that ever happened? I don't, I don't know if the governor ever did. Um, I know that well, if, if memory serves, I think one of the EPA officials said something along those lines, right? Like I, I would drink the water and then when asked to dec <laughs> declined or didn't actually do it, um, which, you know, it, it raises kind of the, uh, the, the idea of that Aaron Brockovich scene. Um, but 
yeah, th- th- there's a lot of do as I say, not as I do kind of mentality. Um, it's very easy for people that are out there, um, whether it's from uh, regulatory agencies, Norfolk Southern to say everything is fine and then go home and sleep somewhere else, right? They don't have to raise their kids in, in, in that community. They don't have to take them to the park. They don't have to worry about whether it's worth investing their money into their house or their business oh, in the yeah. area. We didn't even talk about that. That's that's another enormous aspect of this case is the lack of the diminution of value of their homes. So, I mean, one of, well, many of our clients are, you know, at retirement age or beyond and their whole, all of their money, all their savings is in the, you know, the value of this home, which is now sure. completely shot. And it's 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 really upsetting and people are panicked um you know there be medical monitoring you think there's going to have to be oh, yeah. some type of, and then what are, i mean i don't want to get into the more graphic part but the, the high risk to the pregnant women and the unknowns there all of that is going to come in so this is all going to be laid on the railroad too that's like it's your fault so it's a lot. There's a lot going on. Um, injuries, you know, economic injuries, personal injuries. Um, so, you know, we're doing everything we can, but it's not good. Yeah. When, when, you, when you think about just the sheer scale of this and the need for whether it's medical monitoring or environmental monitoring, that alone is just astronomical, right? And to think that people have to choose between the money they've got in the bank that they've saved up, spent a life to, you know, spent a life building up, et cetera, and getting answers on an ongoing basis as to whether the problem's still there, it's getting worse, it's reaching their water, whether they're coming down with something, God forbid, that's a, that's a tough position to be put in through no choosing or no fault of their own. Right. And that's the thrust of this lawsuit is at a minimum, the company's got to be responsible for giving these people peace of mind over time because these effects won't be known for years down the road. Well, I mean, it does seem that after that time and time again, going back to, you know, Eric Brockovich and PG&E, uh, the, uh, uh, I believe it's called Dark Waters, the, uh, the uh, Ohio, Ohio NDL, but West Virginia and what went on there, the Mark Ruffalo movie. It seems that, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that uh, the, the heightened awareness diminishes right at, you know, not long after it gets out of the headlines and then off to the next contamination. Unfortunately, that's what happens in this country because there's so much bad shit that happens every day and it's on to the next bad event. You know, I mean, it's just horrible. Yeah, we, we, we do a lot of medical monitoring cases here. We do them around the country. And that's the mantra in all of those cases, right? It's, this isn't really a problem. It's not a problem until someone's on their deathbed. And that's just a completely, frankly, it's backwards way of thinking, right? Like we, we, we live in obviously the, the, the greatest era of modern science and medicine where Having information, knowing that you're at risk and being able to de- detect that risk now puts you at an exponentially higher uh, probability of being able to survive whatever happens. And it's almost like, despite that, we don't want to know. We want to we want to be as ignorant as possible of any problems unless and until it's too late. Well, uh, you know, I think that I think we've covered quite a bit here. Uh, I like to sometimes get into the details, but there are. Right now, this is just kind of a, a wait and see. Do you see the uh, any of the federal agencies throwing up some kind of uh, a concerted front to say, hey, we were just doing what we were instructed to do? Do you see that as going as to be an issue? I don't mean legally. I just mean, you know, public relations. Um, I'm not sure at this point. They've been pretty quiet other than filing their lawsuits and being involved in the investigation and maybe some of the remediation. That might change over time. Um, But at some level, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if out of sight, out of mind also applies to 
to some of to some of them, right? And some of and some of their yeah. interests. Ours is very much the opposite. We think the more that people know about what happened, what comes out on a daily or monthly basis about what's still happening there can only benefit not only this community, but every community where these trains run through. And that's everywhere. It is everywhere. This is very much something that can happen at any place, any time, and should be an issue of national concern. In closing, I mean, you know, I'd like for you both to just, get, you know, give a brief summary of what you kind of want to kind of make clear as far as uh, whether it's an agenda, an intent, or what you think should come of this. Uh, ooh, that's that's a loaded one. Uh, what I mean, I think uh, classes should be certified. I think there should be very, very large um, funds for these people, for economic class, for the medical monitoring class, environmental monitoring. Um, and I hope it's soon because they need it and they need it now. So we're doing what we can. We're, we're trying to push for a very, um, you know, quick timeline for discovery and, um, you know, see what we can, see what we can do to move things along as quickly as possible. You know, the only thing that consistently changes corporate conduct is an impact on the bottom line. And um, we desperately need a change in corporate conduct when it comes to the railroads because of the risk, not just to this community, but every community. So, um, you know, there's ramifications beyond getting recovery for these folks who desperately need it. Uh, and I think this is the clearest way to making actual change with how the railroads operate and how they put safety at the top of the list and not just as a talking point. Okay. Yeah, something has to change. Okay. All right. Well, with that, I think, you know, that kind of wraps up. I think we, we covered quite a bit here and it was very informative. And what I would like to do is invite you both back in three months for an update because this is real time and keeping real-time awareness of what's going on, as well as this uh, offers a, a, an opportunity to educate your co your affiliate lawyers around the country on what they may need to do and stay up to speed on in you know contamination cases in their area. So I think in three months, I'd definitely like to have you back. That would be great. And thank you for having us both, Mark. Yes, oh, thanks thank for being you. here, Adam and Dina. Thank you.